Well, thank you so much, Georg, for this nice introduction. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we soon will have an honor, an other anniversary, 100 years. Pharmaco EG may be soon 100 years old because the founder of, um, uh, the founder actually of um, our electroencephalogram was Hans Berger. And he believed that uh, this will be one of the big uh, breakthroughs in the field of psychiatry and neurology. He was a neuropsychiatrist, of course, uh, in Vienna. And, um, but he was also very much interested in the effects of drugs on the, on the brain. So he started to, uh, well, 1929, um, and he published uh, several uh, papers on the effects of certain drugs on the human brain function. And uh, 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 when one looks at the literature, actually, there followed in the next, uh, let's say, 30 years, 600 reports of drug-induced EEG changes. And I think it was uh, really the um, uh, uh, the, the effort of Max Fink, um, who actually collected these data. Um, Max Fink was actually, um, he is perhaps uh, the father of the Pharmaco EEG in the United States. He was working in St. Louis, um, uh, went then to New York, um, uh, and um, when he left, uh, Itil took over, and when Itil left, I took over in St. Louis. Uh, so uh, we come from the same uh, I from the same source of ideas about the pharmaco EEG. Uh, anyhow, he pointed out that the EEG um, uh, with similar clinical effects uh, has also um, uh, similar effects in the writing of the EEG. And that was really a very important uh, statement uh, done by visual analysis at that time. And soon, um, well, uh, uh, one utilized actually the first automatized, computerized analysis of the EEG um, was actually around the uh, years 1970 and onward. Uh, that one could uh, do a single lead analysis. And uh, I mean, I had in in United States as a, the MIP, I, I had many rooms with large, large computers, uh, which would be today, they would have the size of this, of this PC. Anyhow, uh, we worked on that uh, very uh, specifically. And even when I returned to uh, to uh, Vienna, actually, we continue to work then with multi-lead analysis, and uh, from the 1990s on, uh, the multi-lead analysis was the basis for uh, EEG topography, brain maps, two-dimensional maps, and uh, then came the big breakthrough um, uh, that uh, a three-dimensional method was founded, uh, Roberto Pascal Marquis uh, was the genius, actually a mathematician, um, who, um, who created Loretta, low resolution electromagnetic tomography, and suddenly we could go also into the depths of our cortical, um, uh, of, our, uh, of our cortex, and uh, describe uh, where actually was, for instance, a disease located, and on the other hand, where did actually a drug or a therapeutic method um, uh, uh, acts on the brain? And it seems that these two um, uh, uh, aspects actually go together. Um, now, the pharmaco EG, specifically, uh, already with uh, the single lead analysis was first a great, um, um, a great movement uh, because one could determine if a new drug is at all effective as compared with placebo. 
in normal volunteers. Second, how does it change the EEG and the brain function? Is it like a tranquilizer, like a neuroleptic drug, like an antidepressant, and so on? Third, at which doses? Fourth, at which time? When is the onset of the effect? When is the maximum? And when is the end of uh, the effect on the brain? And already these uh, four questions are enormously important for uh, the development of a compound and uh, for later clinical drug trials because you have to go to the patient and you have to, you have to know which doses you take, how often you should give the drug per day, etc. So this was a big breakthrough and uh, uh, the golden years of the pharmaco I think, uh, followed in the, in the sequence. There were, of course, other questions we could answer, equipotency of different form, um, galenic formulations of uh, intramuscular versus intravenous uh, injection, relations to kinetics, relations between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and relation to other pharmacodynamic measures, uh, which became important, for instance, also in dementia research. Okay, and of course, uh, this happened all in phase one at a very early stage of drug development. Of course, all these questions are also interesting in later phases. You know, there are phase two, phase three, phase four uh, within psychopharmacology. Uh, but then came always the question, uh, yeah, is the changes uh, similar in uh, normals and patients? Um, uh, how is the tolerability in relation to clinical variables, prediction of therapeutic outcome? And this brings me to a very important point, the key log principle, because uh, it soon uh, looked like that, that um, actually certain drugs would fit to a certain disease, like a key to a lock. And we call this key lock principle. And this is actually what we, ha what we have in medicine all over. Uh, and there I would like to show you a, uh, only a few examples. Um, but uh, it is based actually, this key lock principle, that we know that different psychiatric disorders uh, have different EEG maps as compared with normal controls. And this we saw in uh, schizophrenia as compared, also schizophrenia as compared with normals with predominantly negative symptomatology, plus symptomatology, depression, generalized anxiety disorder, phobic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, might in fact dementia, dementia of the Alzheimer type, and alcoholic dependency. And they, these, these um, uh, diseases induce different changes in the EEG uh, in regard to total power, absolute delta, theta, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, also in the relative power there are differences, and also in the centroid. We don't want to go in detail because that would <coughs> take more than 12 minutes. Huh? Okay. Um, now, the interesting thing, however, was that EEG mapping also looked different with different psychotropic drugs. And we uh, uh, were investigating, let's say, the main representative uh, compounds of the antipsychotics like chlorpromazine and haloperidol, like imipramine versus citalopram uh, as an activating and a more sedative antidepressant. Um, uh, a daytime tranquilizer, lorazepam, uh, uh, clobazam versus a nighttime tranquilizer. Then uh, psychostimulatory drugs like amphetamine and methylphenidate and pyritinol for the nootropic uh, drug class. All right, so it turns out that uh, we can prove based in one single patient, but also in a group of patients of the same etiological background, uh, that there are significant changes. This is, for instance, um, uh, a demented, uh, these are the uh, 
uh, maps of a demented patient as compared with normal controls. And uh, below actually is, are the changes when we give uh, a nootropic drug, for instance, pyritinol, 600 milligram as compared with placebo. And uh, on the key, the color key always shows an increase or decrease of activity, either as compared with the control uh, or as compared with placebo. And it turns out that there are opposite changes. Let's, for instance, look at the alpha activity. A demented patient has a decrease of alpha activity, while pyretinol would increase alpha activity. And uh, uh, we have this, of course, also in other diseases if we look for a group of patients. Now, this, for instance, is generalized anxiety, patients versus controls. And if we look at the alpha activity, uh, GAD patients have an increased alpha activity. This is the nose, left ear, right ear, and the white dots are electrode positions, whereas an anxiolytic sedative uh, you, uh, utilized for the treatment of uh, these patients induced just the opposite as compared with placebo. And um, uh, this was actually already very interesting, but now that we have uh, Loretta, low resolution electromagnetic tomography, we can um, look, look also in certain specific um, regions of the brain. And this was, for instance, a very uh, imp uh, historical um, uh, Loretta um, uh, article, actually, this was from Pascal McKee, who investigated untreated schizophrenics versus healthy control. And uh, he published this. Uh, and at the same time, we did our haloperitol studies, three milligram versus placebo and normals. And I told, uh, I asked him, please send me the coordinate systems where you see the most differences between untreated schizophrenics and normal controls. And if you, for, for instance, look at the delta, this is the delta power, a horizontal slide, a sagittal slide, and a coronal slide, you see that they show an increase of delta activity um, in, the, in, the, in the single edge gyros, uh, whereas we found blue colors would uh, show haloperidol versus placebo uh, induces a decrease in this activity, or theta activity would be down in the schizophrenics, alpha uh, 1 and alpha 2 as well, while we found an increase. So this is the key log principle. You see that just the opposite changes um, of the treatment process. Uh, now, next question. Uh, depression, for instance. Depress depression, uh, this is the... Uh, patients with, uh, um, with menopausal syndrome and depression uh, as compared with normal control, 60 uh, patients, they show a decrease of theta and alpha Loretta power uh, suggesting a decrease of vigilance while, for instance, when I look at a drug given to them, citalopram, an antidepressant, activating antidepressant, there is an increase of power specifically in the fast activity bands, which means uh -huh, vigilance promotion. Next is, for instance, uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder as compared with normal controls up is in the upper part of the picture, and in the lower one is uh, the effect then under treatment as compared with placebo, just opposite changes key log principle. And finally, um, when we look at the, for instance, also in narcolepsy, at neurological diseases, oh, um, uh, narcolepsy is uh, typical, uh, 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 typical neurological disease uh, characterized by this vigilance decrement during the day. They fall asleep very often during the day. They have a lack of power specific specifically in the, uh, in the fast activity bands, beta 3, beta 2, beta 1, and alpha 2, while modafinil, and there we, have, we can say full, very proudly that we were um, 19, 
86, the first, um, first group who published uh, uh, this drug as compared with placebo in normal, in normal elderly subjects. And this was a, a, a very important development with modafinil uh, uh, in narcolepsy, but also in uh, vigilance decrement and just the opposite. So again, if you have a decrement in a, in a certain region, you should give something which would actually improve this uh, just to the opposite. And this is not so, uh, so not so new. If you have a low blood sugar, you have to increase your blood sugar. If, you, if your blood sugar is too high, you have a drug which decreases blood sugar. Okay? And this is uh, the, the key lock principle. And uh, so, um, uh, in conclusion, the utilization of electrophysiological measures in the pharmacotherapy of mental disorders is based on two prerequisites. First, knowledge of the neurophysiological changes induced by the disease and knowledge of the CNS effects of psychotropic drugs. But that you have to measure. And, uh, and this is all what it's our meeting is today about, not only clinical, but also with objective and quantitative methods. And it seems that certain uh, mental disorders, as compared with controls, induce changes which are just opposite to the drugs which they are used for the, for the treatment of these diseases. And finally, thus, it may be possible to choose the optimum drug for a specific patient according to a key lock principle also in the individual patient. And this is a very important point because no cardiologist would today treat any cardiac disease without looking beside the clinical information uh, to the organ he treats. And this is what I wanted to bring across, uh, that we have here a great future and all the tools which we have um, should be fostered actually um, because um, objective and quantitative data, they really brought us always further on in, in, the, in the field of medicine. Thank you so much.